From the ghettos of Kingston to the streets of London and New York, Jamaican criminals are pushing crack cocaine with unprecedented violence. It's a world police officers have found almost impossible to penetrate until they found a top informant. Scotland Yard thought they could fight fire with fire. Tonight, World in Action asks, who really got burnt? extremely successful informant because of the position that he was in. He was well worth the investment into it and it is extremely unfortunate and to the detriment of the people of London that we no longer have him available to us. This is the story of the Metropolitan Police's top Yardie informant. It's the story of how Eaton Leonard Green went on a sustained spree of crack dealing, armed robbery and shootings while being paid to prevent crime. It's the story of how the Yard allowed Green to help two Jamaicans they believe to be multiple killers into the UK. And it's the story of how Scotland Yard obstructed another force investigating the biggest mass robbery on record and then tried to kill off the trial that led to his eventual conviction. The law is the law and it shouldn't be abused and it sh certainly shouldn't be abused by those who are charged with implementing it. Deeper than that, I think, is the fact that it's wrong because it affects ordinary members of the public, because decisions are being made on their behalf without their knowledge and without necessarily their support. This warehouse in Nottingham was once a regular weekend venue for Jamaican blues parties. But that came to a violent end on the 6th of June 1993 when Eaton Green, Scotland Yard's top informer, led an armed raid and held the place up. Firing guns and wielding a machete, the gang ordered all 150 guests to hand over their valuables. The one man who tried to resist them was shot by Eaton Green, who refused to allow him to go to hospital. We actually dedicated an enormous amount of resources to it, uh, partly to make a very clear statement to people that if they come to Nottingham and commit that sort of offence, then we treat it very, very seriously. Nottinghamshire's vigorous investigation ended up with seven people in the dock. They were convinced they had a solid case, but they reckoned without Scotland Yard. Nottingham detectives had no idea that one of the people up before the court was the Yard's star grass. Nor could they have any idea of the desperate lengths to which the Yard would go to protect him. Eaton Green was Scotland Yard's most effective secret weapon in the fight against Yardie crime. They were devastated when they did eventually lose him we face a serious problem of drugs related violence unless we have some way of keeping track of who's here what the names are that are about we have to do something with it he was an extremely prolific a very useful informer and it's a tragedy for us that he's no longer available to us Eden Green's road to the dock had begun here in the ghetto of Kingston Jamaica a place run by criminal gangs so powerful, they're linked to the main political parties. Green became a gunman at the age of 12. By 24, he'd served five years in prison. After his arrest, he told Nottingham police officers he had no choice but to become a gunman. I've grown up in the ghetto of Jamaica where you have to respect your elders. There are people in Jamaica that you have to look up to. When I say look up to a mean, here a leader, 
you know, you can't really dictate mm -hmm. to those kind kind of people. You do as you are told. Mm -hmm. I've been shot so many times. And in, a, in order for me to get away from this horrible life that I live, is to assist the police about people like myself. Green's story is all too common for a boy from the ghettos of Kingston. God of mercy and power, Banish violence from our midst and wipe away our tears. That we Father Richard Albert is a Catholic priest orders. based in the ghetto of Kingston. All our faith is in your saving help. Protect us from men of violence and keep us His safe. work brings him into daily contact with the gunmen and, and so he has first-hand experience of the brutality of their world. Brother, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Two, three weeks ago I was sitting watching the news. At 6.30 at night when I heard two loud gun bursts and um, I just went out my gate down one block and two men were just blown away. The and the one unfortunately was a 15 year old schoolboy. You know, it was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, about three months ago right outside the gate under the tree. Uh, the woman, uh, she was at mass this morning. Her son was murdered, her house was firebombed and her nephew's just been murdered. So um, gun violence is endemic and unfortunate. Um, it's, uh, you know, very, very serious. Uh, it's really, um, in many sections of the inner city, there's anarchy on the streets. They are a group of traveling drugs traffickers who are willing to resort to extreme violence. They are difficult to penetrate. They are paranoid, treacherous, violent, unstable, and they operate in a culture that is difficult for other cultures to understand. One man was to provide Scotland Yard with a window into this treacherous and violent world. He arrived in Britain in 1991. Eaton Green had skipped bail while on a charge of attempted murder in Jamaica. He disappeared onto the streets of the capital where no one knew him but it was only a matter of time before he turned back to crime and ran across the police. The very first time he was arrested, he turned informer, rather than face a possible life sentence in Jamaica. Over the next two years, Green was to supply his handler, PC Steve Barker, with 168 detailed reports. These so-called informant sheets provide a record of almost every contact Green had with his handlers and describe a world of drug dealing and casual violence where the only law is that of the gun. Tuffy generally doesn't carry a gun in Brixton, as he says, is well known there. He does carry a gun when he's in North London. Why tell them all your secrets? Dwayne told him he had arranged a meeting with some people selling the cocaine and that he should wear all his jewellery to show he was rich. When Mark came in, Scorpion held him up with a luga. Steve was involved in a shooting a Sunday a couple of weeks ago. Someone tried to rob a Jamaican call and his wife at the dance at Maxim's and the robber fired a shot. Steve chased him and fired three shots. Tuffy was at Sandringham Road last night. He had the German Luger with him. He was in fear of his position. He needed to produce results. Here was a man who knew he was wanted in Jamaica in relation to an offence that carries a potential life sentence. So he was between the devil and deep blue sea. If he didn't seek to cooperate and produce results very, very quickly, then the corollary was there that he'd be shipped out back to Jamaica to the uncertain fate that awaited him there. But the man who was working for the yard was still a yardie at heart, a drug dealing gunman who had no regard for police guidelines on how informers are supposed to behave. Scotland Yard's top grass was out of control. He was getting away with everything. Attempted murder, drug dealing, shooting, wounding, everything. Larry Lynch, who was cleared of the Nottingham Warehouse robbery, knew Green well. We tracked him down in the suburbs of Kingston. He was involved in an attempted murder in either ours in our knees then, which he got arrested, went on ID parade, and the guy that got shot, dad went, didn't pick him out, and charges were dropped. 
Why do you think that person didn't pick Leon out? Fear. Fear of what? His life. Repercussion. May come back. Gangland. Yardy thing. Another one of his associates told us that Green routinely used violence to rip off fellow drug dealers. It was with a few friends and some African guy came into this particular house. Green pulled a gun and told him to hand over what he had. The guy refused and he butted him in the mouth with the gun. The guy took out an ounce of crack and gave it to him. After that, the African had some cash on him. Green took the cash, disappeared, then went back to this house and all the girls that were there in the house got £100 each. The officers who were handling Eaton Green at no time ever had any evidence that he was committing criminal offences and Eaton Green was warned, as all our informers are, that if they're committing crime and they're discovered to be doing so, they will be prosecuted. But there was one bloody night that should have told the police all they needed to know about Eaton Green. He was arrested with crack cocaine after a gun battle in Brixton. Green had shot a man at a blues party and was himself hit in the stomach. He lost a kidney. He was arrested at hospital and charged with intent to supply cocaine. But the case against him was never pursued. In order to be of use to the yard, Green had to stay on the streets. That also meant avoiding deportation. A confidential report from the Immigration Department said they'd made copious checks with police about Green. Yet it appears the Immigration Department had no knowledge of the fact that Green was wanted for attempted murder in Jamaica. His application to stay here was granted. But one simple call to a Jamaican court would have told Scotland Yard about Eaton Green's violent past. Jamaican police had charged him with wounding with intent, their equivalent of attempted murder. But Green's employment as an informer takes on a chilling significance when his full history is known. While on remand for the Nottingham robbery, Green confessed to killing a man in Jamaica. The Yard had a murderer on their books. When the police uh, carried out a covert tape recording of all the defendants uh, in the cells when they'd been arrested, uh, Green was happily discussing um, that murder with one of uh, his co-accused and making a mission about it. The police should have said, right, we've got a chap here who has admitted a murder on these covert tapes in Jamaica. There's uh, evidence that it's that already been gathered we should take him back there and have that case processed and prosecuted. There had never been any question of sending Green home. Quite the opposite. Green convinced officers that he needed to bring some known gunmen here to increase his credibility. He told his handler, PC Steve Barker, that two men, Cecil Thomas and Rowan Bumpy Thomas, were leading members of one of the most feared gangs in Jamaica. And it was on a police telephone that Green discussed arrangements for their arrival in the UK. This is astonishing, as he painted a picture of two mass murderers, each responsible for the killing of ten men. What's even more staggering is that when Eaton Green paid for Cecil and Rowan Thomas to fly to Britain in March 1993, they were actually allowed into the country. Scotland Yard, Immigration and Customs knew they were coming, yet still they walked out onto the streets of Britain. Within months they were in the dock for the Nottingham Warehouse robbery. It was known that Rowan was going to be coming under a false name, um, with a false passport, with a false invitation letter, so clearly um, he could have been turned back. What's more, Cecil Thomas's story to immigration didn't stand up. Cecil was stopped and he said, look, I've come for my cousin's wedding. He was asked the name of the cousin's bridegroom, bridegroom-to-be, and he was unable to provide that. His passport was taken away for a short while and then they came back and gave him temporary leave to remain for seven days. 
Customs searched the Thomases for drugs. Immigration copied their passports and secretly filmed them. Almost every agency which could know, did know about their arrival. Both men were convicted gunmen and had broken immigration law to get into the country. It's clear that someone, somewhere, wanted them to get through. Three months later, both men were arrested for the warehouse robbery. Nottingham police had little difficulty tracking down Cecil and Rowan Thomas. They'd already been arrested on firearms offences by Scotland Yard. Getting their hands on the Yard's top informant was less straightforward. They contacted Green's handler, PC Barker, at Brixton Police Station to ask him where his man was. As Green's handler for the past two years, he knew more about his movements than any other officer. PC Barker continued to speak to Green throughout Nottingham's investigation of the warehouse robbery. Barker received vital information about the robbery in which his prize informer was involved. But was this information ever passed to Nottingham? Scotland Yard's records say it was, but Nottingham insists they never received it. That was actually subject of quite a lot of debate during the course of the trial, and you'll know our position in that in that we never actually saw that uh, information at all. So how do you explain the fact that it says on the information sheets that information was passed to Nottingham? Well again, that is something really that uh, you'll have to take up with the Metropolitan Police and not ourselves. The information flow did work. It didn't always work as well as it, it should have done. So you're saying that information might not have got through? I'm saying that a great deal of information got through to them which they then made use of. Not only did information fail to reach Nottingham, but the Yard also failed to turn over their informer when they knew that Nottingham wanted to arrest him. Nottingham officers came to London for that purpose on the 5th of July 1993 and asked Steve Barker to help find Green. But as records show, Barker met Green at Isis House in South London a day later and failed to arrest him. It wasn't until the day after that that Nottingham finally got their man at an East London phone box. At the warehouse robbery trial, Green swore on oath that at the ISIS house meeting he'd confessed to his role in the crime, yet Barker hadn't arrested him. The judge didn't mince his words. I am very disturbed at the way in which those responsible for handling Mr. Green appeared not only to have failed to cooperate, but possibly to have impeded Nottingham's inquiries. The Home Office rules on informers who take part in crime are clear. The police must never commit themselves to a course which, whether to protect an informant or otherwise, will constrain them to mislead a court in any subsequent proceedings. But even when the case got to court, the Met continued to try to protect their man. Not even the prosecution or the judge knew Green's true status as the top yardy grass. It was only when two defence barristers met the judge in chambers to say they suspected their clients had been led to the dock by an informant that the truth began to emerge. The rules about disclosure are very clear. The prosecution must disclose any information which would be of assistance to the defence. And what they were doing, in fact, wasn't prosecuting case, they were persecuting. We had people there who were proved to be innocent. They were tricking us, they were not telling us things which we were entitled to know. In desperation, a senior Yard officer even contacted the prosecution to try to get them to stop the trial. Green grass, why tell the trees what ain't so? Not only did this cut across Nottingham's investigation, but had the Yard succeeded, Eaton Green could have got away with shooting a man in the biggest robbery in British history. Why tell them all your secrets?
A judge decided the trial was so compromised, he ordered it restarted. With Green turning Queen's evidence, Rowan Thomas was found guilty, but is appealing. Cecil Thomas was acquitted. Green himself got six years. We begin this evening with a matter which has elicited condemnation. It started with a protest this morning at the intersection of Hagley Park and Waltham Park Roads in Kingston, and it ended in tragedy. Cecil Thomas is deported to Jamaica on a day of appalling bloodshed on the streets of Kingston. At the center of the news is a policeman who assaulted a journalist and opened fire in a crowd of demonstrators. We give thanks to the good Lord for the gift of the new day, but we want to remember all those who were shot yesterday, the count is up to 10 now, two have died. We want to pray for peace in our community. A noted criminal was killed by the police early yesterday morning about 2.30. And then, as you know, the roadblocks and the shootings continued but the place Cecil Thomas is returning to is as bad as it ever was when it shaped gunmen like Eaton Green the production line continues I can understand why the security forces are brought to the limit themselves sometimes of proper action and legal reaction because we're facing an insidious enemy with this gunman ship we're facing uh, 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 um, anarchy on the streets. Um, we're facing people who um, have no moral scruples themselves, who have no hesitation to do some terrible, terrible, wicked things. Back home in Kingston, after his acquittal, the only thing Cecil Thomas has to show for three turbulent years are his legal documents, including Eaton Green's informant file. He believes the Yard was blinded to the reality of its relationship with Green. Obviously, they don't understand anything about Jamaica. Yeah? And in a big way. And they wanted to understand so bad that and when this guy is telling them lies, they are just accepting it. You understand? I'm not checking it, and they are working off that. Green was a seductive informant for Scotland Yard. They thought he gave them access to a closed world. But the question is, was the Yard running Eden Green, or was he running them? While in their employ, he was shooting people, dealing crack and bringing alleged murderers into the country. And when another police force wanted to arrest him, the Yard failed to turn him in. One thing's for certain, Eaton Green won't want to return to Jamaica. There's a hangman's noose waiting for him for murder and a gangster's bullet for betrayal. It was disclosed in court that I am an informant, but to be honest, I don't regret it. The reason I don't regret it is this. It gives me the opportunity to change my life for the better. Because this has been disclosed now, so there is no turning back for me in the life that I used to live, namely badness. That's all I wish to say at this stage. Now don't you tell it to the breeze Cause she'll run and tell it to the birds and bees And everyone will know Because you done told the blabbing trees Yes you did You told them once before So that's why It ain't no secret anymore mm, mm, mm. Why tell them all the old they're buried under the snow Whispering grass, don't tell the trees Cause the trees don't 